want to share a little bit about ground floor, which is the context for this conversation. Um, ground floor is a biennial exhibition of work by of new work by artists who have recently graduated from MFA programs in Chicago. In this case, uh, it is a group of artists who have graduated in 2019 and 2020. This is the sixth iteration of the biennial um, and the artists are selected through a very competitive process. So um, um, a large group of artists are nominated, there is a jury, and then we have the really exciting pleasure of working with uh, 20 artists uh, for each exhibition. So 10 artists um, who graduated in 2019 and uh, 10 artists who graduated in 2020. Um, and then we work together on this exhibition, um, which you'll see selection of, of uh, artists work. Um, tonight, I'm really excited to welcome a group of artists who in very distinct ways are mining uh, expressions of culture, past and present to produce meaning through their work. Uh, so each of the artists will introduce themselves and will introduce their practice a little bit before we um, join them in conversation. So I will share my screen. Do you see the presentation? I'm not seeing it. I can't see it. Um, yeah, let's try to reshare it again. Okay. It just worked a minute ago. Yeah. Still no? Mm -mm. Hmm. Yeah, hold on. You can share it too if you like. Just bring it up for you. Hold on one second. Thank you, Sierra. So we'll start with Cecilia. Hi, hi everybody. Um, I'm Cecilia Beaven. I'm originally from Mexico, from Mexico City. And I live in Chicago since 2017. Um, I came to Chicago to do an MFA in painting and drawing at SEIC. And then um, I stayed a bit longer. So now I'm based here. Um, what we're seeing right now is my one of my installations that I did for ground floor um, for the biennial. I did two, so this is one of them, and um, my work touches on mythology, especially um, Mexican mythology, and in particular, I take as inspiration um, the Aztec mythology. So this piece has to do with that. Um, but I guess we'll talk about that a little later. Um, yeah, this is how my work looks like. Um, I do painting, but also drawing, sculpture, um, video, um, animation. So I consider myself more of a multidisciplinary artist, and I think my work makes the most sense when I, I'm able to put everything together. Um, so this is an example of that. This is a show I had in 2019. It was a solo show in Side Gallery um, entitled Two-Headed Turtle. And I was talking about this same themes of mythology and building a personal speculative mythology. Um, these are some more examples of my work. These are um, wooden cutouts that I assembled and painted as if they were a canvas, but they're like this dimensional paintings. Um, I guess where my work is right now is trying to think about painting in this um, expanded way. So this was a, sort of like an experiment for that. Uh, 
And murals are a big part of my practice. Um, these were murals that I made in 2018 in Japan. That's the port of Hikata. Um, Hikata is a small town in the Kagawa prefecture. And while being there for one summer, I offered the city or the, the town if I could do some murals there and they supported my idea. And um, I left those there. Uh, these were actually just um, restored like a couple of weeks ago, which made me very happy. So they're officially part of the aesthetics of the town. Uh, hi, this is Stella. Um, I am, I graduated from UIC Fine Arts Program in 2019. Um, you're going to see photos of work that's in the exhibition and it's all from the body of work that I kind of finished during graduate school and showed in my, um, the UIC thesis exhibition that I'm calling Future Geologies. Um, and these are all rocks that um, come from buildings that have been demolished in Chicago. So I've been very interested in this work continues in the idea of the Anthropocene as the literal geologic scientific um, epoch rather than the kind of like cultural era that we're living in. Um, so I'm looking at the city as a, as a geologic landscape and trying to think about the, how humans are creating geology in real time um, by sort of looking into the future and preserving buildings that would have in hundreds of thousands, millions of years compressed over time into a rock layer. Uh, so because they're demolished, they, they aren't allowed to become those rocks. And so these are sort of like future preservation of a thing that would have existed. Um, this is this particular work is uh, based on a building at 2159 West 21st Street in Pilsen. Um, and so there's some documentation of the site after the demolition, thinking about it as thinking about the man-made materials, the brick and the concrete and the terrazzo and the rebar as, as um, geologic features of the landscape. Um, and there's also an essay with this work that kind of talks about that, that space that a building takes up in a landscape and what happens when it disappears. Um, and this one is a, is a core sample or an imagined core sample of what the building would be if it had been compressed. Um, and then in the front, the front window uh, at the Hyde Park Art Center, these are these are cubes and each one is a rock that represents a different building um, in Chicago. And they're made using a, a sort of terrazzo process. So they're made from materials collected from the buildings, from the demolition sites, and then encased and mixed in with the concrete and then sort of ground down to reveal them. Maybe I shouldn't have revealed that because <laughs> they're because really they're rocks from the future. <laughs> Hi, uh, my name is Jay Kent, they, them, she, her. Uh, I graduated from the Northwestern MFA program in this past uh, fall, I suppose. Um, I like to talk a little bit about biography just because it feels um, pertinent in terms of how I think of my work. Um, so f a lot uh, of the things come from collections that are found. Um, and in sort of like the past 10 years, I've had various jobs working with communities uh, of people who are experiencing economic uh, or housing precarity. Uh, and so in that time I lived on site and worked directly with these communities. Um, so I'm always really interested in sort of the objects that people have in their life and then how systems of both care and neglect function. So often what I'm making are kind of collections of things that have been thrown out or discarded or things that I find uh, as I'm walking around the neighborhoods. Um, I'm really attracted to things that have a kind of post-consumer desire uh, or sort of remnants of remains of um, sort of advertised uh, 
like neurochemical attraction. So things um, like color and shape and form, and then looking at those things and seeing how they've been processed through uh, being left outside or run over by cars or rained on. Um, so I think it's trying to think about how we both preserve things and neglect things and then making a kind of surrogate uh, argument around the absence of the bodies and people who are present within these um, pieces. So uh, these pieces are collections of found objects um, in which I'm trying to think through everyday aesthetics and specifically a uh, kind of art discourse that I never really felt connected to personally. And I think a lot of people, especially when you have concerns of how you're going to make money or um, take care of family members, things like that, uh, thinking about how aesthetics are still present um, and things like desire and color um, are found within these objects for people who aren't maybe um, thinking of themselves engaging with a sort of art discourse. Um, and so it's all kind of post, post consumer uh, waste um, that I find myself drawn to. Hi everyone, my name is Percy. I graduate um, from SAIC uh, from the Fiber and Material Study Department. And I just recently graduated um, last May, 2020. Um, <clears throat> my practice, it's solely focused on um, my identity as a um, US immigrant from Hong Kong. Um, now, um, um, like uh, <clears throat> focusing on the um, I so call it the remote relationship of myself to Hong Kong. Um, while I am um, currently not, I mean, uh, currently in the US, um, I see um, the way of my practice is a way of mending um, to the um, to to reconnect um, the my birthplace, which is Hong Kong. Um, and um, my work here for the Grand Floor um, is primarily focusing on the neon culture of Hong Kong, which um, it's um, disappearing. Um, um, I'm gonna go downstairs because I'm gonna do work on my taxes. This goes on for two hours. Oh, okay. Wait, I hope I muted this. Oh, stop. <laughs> what? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> so, um, yeah, the the <clears throat> the work that you the images that you see here were the work uh, are the works that I am presenting for this one for exhibition. The first two one um, is the actual neon um, recreation of um, 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 like like some certain objects. Um, um, and here, the image here that you can see is um, another um, replication of a uh, neon signage, which um, is um, a hand embroidery um, method um, that I um, wanted to um, celebrate um, and kind of um, um, use it as a way to preserve um, the disappearing neon culture. Um, to capture um, 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 those um, beautiful moments of Hong Kong. Oh, um, I think Mariana, you can. Um, yeah. Yeah. Sierra, we want to share, talk more about those images later. Yes. Thank you. Um, so, you all have practices that are informed by culture, uh, whether or not it is um, cultures of the past or the moment that we're living in. Um, could you talk a little bit about how you use uh, culture as an idea, as a, as a material in your work? Um, and, and what do you hope to do with it? Whoever wants to go first can. 
Um, I can go. So I reference um, Mexican mythology, in particular Aztec. Um, I'm interested in these because that's where I'm from, and I'm interested in narrative and stories that have been told um, at the place where I'm from. So the pre-Columbian culture in Mexico City um, was the Aztec culture, so I'm particularly drawn to that as like a, an original point for narratives and visual aesthetics. Um, and I know that I'm aware that many layers of narrative have been um, overlaid on top of this like original narrative, and I'm more a result of that overlay. Uh, but I still think it's very useful and um, for myself, for my practice, to kind of go back all the way to like the origin of all of this. Um, so I'm interested in that, but I also kind of make it my own. And for me, that's important to mm -hmm. show my own account of how I look at these forms um, instead of directly using these aesthetics. Um, yeah. I could go next. Um, I think I'm using culture in a very different way, <laughs> clearly, but um, I think that the at the moment we live in the human human therefore culture is sort of intertwined with the geologic in a way that is will go on forever and has been going on for probably since the beginning I mean isn't that's the big question with the Anthropocene when did it begin but in my opinion has been going on for since the beginning of like human existence and um I, I like the idea that at the core of this, that it's bringing up that humans aren't human plus nature brings this thing. It's that humans are a part of nature and that these rocks are very clearly man-made, but that every, every rock and every also like ecosystem and environment in the entire world is affected by the things that we've been doing, that human culture has been doing for hundreds and thousands of years. So. I'm hoping that this kind of like bringing up the, the built environment um, and turning it into something that looks more natural brings up that like, that sort of confusion um, in maybe thinking that way that I've, that I have accepted, <laughs> come to my side. <laughs> yeah, I think I resonate with what Stella is saying in terms of um, trying to, uh, bring people closer to a culture or, and or environment that maybe they don't perceive as personal to themselves. You know, I think it's the problem of, you know, something as simple as like a plastic drinking straw and the belief that when you, when you are personally finished with it, it kind of disappears from your consciousness, but the idea that um, that physical object still remains. And so um, things that people have really intimate contact with um, then, start having a real material presence um, and start building up and accumulating. And then at some point, this uh, sort of thing that's been intentionally rendered uh, invisible or obfuscated starts becoming um, a kind of physical mass that we have to contend with. Um, and the idea that like, we are both intimately connected to those things and also um, very, very distanced from it simultaneously. So I think this idea of trying to um, yeah, pull, pull, pull things back to a, like personal identification um, with the individual is important to me when speaking about culture. Um, to me, I think I'm more like using culture in a, in a uh, relatively um, lit, literal way, which I see culture as a way to reflect my identity. Um, and, um, as I am working on, um, like, like through like the past several years, that my work has been only focused on the culture of Hong Kong, um, like my 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 past um, when I was uh, lived in Hong Kong, the, like the memories, um, the experiences, um, I. Um, Sometimes that I would feel some challenging, um, like to to kind of like um, you could say maybe like to foster 
like a um, uh, like a um, totally it's like a culture from Eastern science in a Western country. Um, but um, I I don't know. I just um, like like in my work, I I I. I I hope that um, people um, like could tell from my work that um, um, how much that I was connected um, to my personal culture um, and hope to in some way um, to um, foster or like to share um, more about um, the Hong Kong culture to a wider audience, especially that um, I am, um, you know, um, in uh, overseas. Thank you for that. Um, hearing some of this made me curious too about um, practices and methodologies that are part of your work. Uh, I'm curious about what research looks like, uh, but also what um, process is like for you in your work. Um, you, you go Stella. <laughs> um, I think a, a, like a lot of my work is research and maybe even part of the part of the like work itself is showing that research. Um, and I'm obviously kind of using using scientific methodologies that I'm appropriating and like I'm I'm not um, trained in any way other than self-taught in geology or science, but I'm sort of appropriating those, those methods, um, of research and a presentation in order to, like, take the authority that we see in science and, and kind of, like, turn it back on something that maybe is questionably scientific. Um, and for me, research is sort of, and I learned this in graduate school, I'm not a studio artist, I'm like a collecting, exploring artist. And so for me, my work is going out, collecting um, like rock material and building material and sort of like into the work. Um, and I think showing, you can see it, especially in the, the core sample and the photos above it, like the photos are part of the research, but then in this case, I'm choosing to make them part of the finished work. And I also like often connect text and writing that has a lot of research put into it to it because I think I, I want to share all the things that I've put into to researching and just sort of like spill it out in front of you and let you take what you want from it. Um, for me, it's it's very different. I am more of a studio artist and I part of my process is to be super uh, playful and at the studio and to do a lot of experimentation while I'm there. Um, I guess that's why I'm a multidisciplinary artist because sometimes experimentation feels right in drawing and sometimes in painting and then one media starts to respond to another. Um, and in terms of research, um, I feel like I'm constantly consuming uh, images and narratives, and I sort of do it um, even compulsively, um, like watching films and cartoons and reading graphic novels and reading comics. And uh, I attend a lot of talks and lectures and I'm just very aware and I think I consume a lot of things all the time. So that becomes research. I'm always taking notes, doing sketches, and that turns into its own thing. Uh, then I come back to the studio and like research further. Um, some of the topics that I'm interested in to do more formal research are mythology, um, ethnography, history, of course, because I'm talking about uh, a culture that did exist and flourished in, in Mexico. Um, so I, I read of, of that. Um, and also, I guess, in terms of methods, uh, ethnography is a method. So that's kind of like how I do my work, by observing and taking notes, uh, both as in form of drawings or in form of text.
um, I, for me, um, I think my research is a little bit more difficult um, because um, as I, as I um, presented earlier that um, my work focuses on the uh, culture of Hong Kong. And while I'm currently not physically presented in Hong Kong, a lot of my research is actually based on um, online sources. Um, and um, I would say um, primarily um, like um, I was just taking it from my um, memories, from my experience um, from the past. Um, um, though, so those are not very, so, so, so maybe, maybe, maybe sometimes my research sometimes are not too relevant, but um, I think that's kind of um, um, one of the um, interesting things that for my work is to um, is how how that I utilize um, um, my past experience and memories and um, to connect um, um, the present right now uh, where I am at right now. Um, uh, but I also do um, follow and watch a lot of um, news and article um, of the currently happening, what is going on in Hong Kong. Um, even though I, 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 I'm, now, I'm now living in the US, but I still um, very closely follow when um, the news, um, the updates um, in Hong Kong through like um, various of news resources. Um, and in terms of um, the method, um, Mariana, I would like to talk about um, like the last two images that from the slide, um, which I prepared. Um, I wanted to share um, just a little bit with how um, my research, I mean, um, the process of um, I um, research the neon um, culture. So um, uh, for, for uh, take, take my um, neon work, for example, um, as talking about the um, methods of uh, research, um, like in, uh, while I was still in grad school, um, during the uh, summer in 2019, um, I um, went, returned to Hong Kong and um, I, because I knew that um, I would like to continuing um, to um, focusing on the neon culture, which I am not, I wasn't quite familiar with. So um, I, when I was, I went back to Hong Kong, I uh, founded a um, local neon worker um, and I um, asked him um, if I can um, work in your studio and um, to maybe um, um, just do some practice. Um, so um, for that summer, um, I was um, in a um, uh, in um, a Hong Kong local neon studio for like a week and I was there to um, learned um, how to um, bend um, uh, Chinese characteristics uh, to be specific uh, because um, I wish to learn how to um, make um, Chinese character in neon. Um, um, and um, so that was uh, fairly authentic because um, I really got a chance to be uh, physically in person um, on site to really um, um, by like um, learn from from the uh, master um, by observing I and working with him, um, which um, like that experience really enriched um, my um, practice of um, the neon. Um, and I also. Um, this picture is a um, is my um, bathroom view um, from Hong Kong. Um, as you can see, the window bar right there is actually the uh, which is was the reference of um, my um, work uh, called View from Home. Um, it which is a maybe Mariana can show the picture, which is a, the second images of um, from my presentation. I. Um, so this work, I was just trying to um, um, 
we create um, the window bar that is a very um, typical stereotype um, design, um, but uh, we create it with uh, using um, neon um, as a way to um, um, talk about um, like the disappearing neon culture and also um, how I um, perceive um, my surrounding um, while I'm in right now in Chicago, but um, using um, the Hong Kong uh, window bar as a gaze um, to um, explore. Thank you for that. Um, I'm curious in the case of Cecilia and Percy about um, how in a way the, the work is, is very personal, um, but at the same time I see um, how someone who shares your culture could, could um, connect with the work uh, on a deeper level just based on their understanding of, uh, of cultural references and things like that. Um, how do you think of that balance between what is your, your person in the work and, and what is about uh, Cecilia in your case, Mexican mythology and Percy in your case, Hong Kong? Um, well, for me, um, well, there's one thing I tried to do work that is very um, introspective and personal. So besides the the like mythological narrative interest, I I do this and I use like my my own character. It's like a self representative character or self portrait, and that character kind of inhabits the different narratives and. So my work also touches on these themes that are uh, very personal and sincere that I feel become very universal because of being so um, just like honest and transparent. So that's a way in which I make the personal uh, relatable. And then for the mythology, I don't try to use um, this mythology as uh, an aesthetic instead I, I use it as a narrative reference um, so i try to use my own style and assimilate these ideas through my own scope um, so hopefully people can see my work and first feel like intrigued by it and then interested in it and try to um, insert their own narratives or their own ideas try to decipher um, what it is about before just thinking like, oh, this is Mexican. Um, because that way it can be open. And then if a conversation starts and people realize that I'm talking about something that comes from my country, then that's, that's great. If they feel like they can learn something from my work, that's, that's the best. But if not, I feel like there, there's still material for everybody to engage with my work um, on different levels. Um, yeah. Um, for me, um, I have like, um, when I receive your this question, Mariana, um, how do you think the balance between personal and cultural narratives or content in your work? Um, this actually helps me to um, reflect um, on my um, on, on, on on my work because um, I, I I think of this question as a comparison to um, Cecilia's work. Um, uh, in Cecilia's work, I I think um, 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 it's a lot of um, 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 personal um, more like. Um, energy that is going on that I'm feeling. Um, but I think my work is more like um, like the cultural contact first than the personal part. Um, like um, for example, like when, when, when you just first experience my work, um, you would um, have a very strong um, cultural impact by um, what um, the um, images that I 
have to use it as a weapon or like uh, let's say the, the neon or the, the, the characters of the neon. Um, so, um, but I think um, what is interesting of my work is it's um, like um, my personal narratives is actually comes with the, um, it's the process of um, making the work. Because um, um, I have um, heard that from a lot of people, like my friends, that they told me um, that they, they can feel um, like how much effort and um, how much um, 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 time that I spend to create my work that 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 they really feel um, like um, my my passion or like I really care about um, what I am um, researching for, which is um, the Hong the culture of Hong Kong. Um, so um, as I'm thinking this question, how do I think the balance, or how do I balance the cultural aspect and the personal aspect? Yeah, I would set to say that. Um, maybe the process of making, it's a way to um, connect um, personal and cultural narratives um, together. Yeah, I do see in your work, Percy, a lot of that care and, and I feel like um, it, it's very personal and loving as a gesture in your making. Um, but I also see it connecting to like greater cultural shift as in thinking about how the city is changing, right? And how you're responding to that too. So yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, totally. So an underlying question for us at the art center when we think about ground floor is the question of why artists choose chicago as a place um, to develop their practices and um, so i wonder and i wanted to ask if there are ways in which the city and its histories um, and communities have influenced your work during your time here as a as a person living in the city, but also as a person studying in the city, as an artist who chose to, um, chose the city as a place to develop their practice. I'm, I'm from Chicago. I did an undergraduate program in New York and came back and always had the intention of coming back and I have no intention of leaving. <laughs> um, so I guess I did choose to stay here, whereas a lot of artists that I grew up with go to New York, go to LA. Um, but in addition to it just being really compared to my experience in New York and what, you know, conversations with artists that live in other places, it is such a like open, not so competitive place to make art, I think, supportive of other people, of, of the artists among themselves. Um, and I think because, I mean, I think the fact that I'm from here has really like shaped my brain and sort of made me make the work that I make. I think, I think about this place as a landscape and some of this work was kind of inspired by the personal sadness of the loss of like the overpass over Belmont on Western that I grew up near as a kid. And it's this like, it's like a hill. It's, it's like a rise in the, in the land that you always see your whole life and it's suddenly gone. And it made me feel sad. <laughs> but I think that's like a, a personal kind of selfish nostalgic thing that I'm not sure everyone would um, identify with. So I think my interest was finding that thing for everyone or sort of kind of like pulling something out of that like loss of a piece of landscape and bringing it back into that idea of you know the way that we're leaving permanent um changes to the landscape uh so i guess i kind i think of chicago as like my medium like the thing that we've put here um is the material that i use and i and that is sort of like has culture and humans implicit in it, but I am much more interested in, in bringing that into it, especially after this summer when 
the idea of like the destruction of a building or of a storefront with um, with protests and with looting feels sort of like selfish that I would that I would put um, that much care into a structure. So I am interested, I think, in the future and kind of like folding more discussion of of the narrative of the of the the life of the building that the humans that humans that built it that spent their lives in those buildings put into it. Um, so yeah, I'm I think it's it's in my brain, but I'm interested in bringing that more into my work. Yeah, explicitly. Um, like Stella, I'm from Chicago, so uh, I don't have a lived experience to really compare it to other cities, but uh, I'm always interested when people aren't from here to ask them what their experience of Chicago is. And I think what I have learned both from those conversations, but also personal experiences is that, um, I mean, first and foremost, I think there's not the same uh, like crushing economic reality of other cities like New York. So I think that Chicago can be hospitable to kinds of new forms of exchange and exploration so that there's um, people and places where you can uh, make some mistakes and also like build up uh, because there's just both freedom and support. You know, there's lots of histories of alternative art spaces and house museums and things like that. Uh, and I also think there's something about Chicago, which I, I both love and hate, that it feels like um, there's a sort of a quality that people are just excited that you're doing something. So maybe it's not intellectually critical, but it's just um, happy that you're out there, you know, putting on putting on a school play. Um, I remember the, the the piece that's in the show with the collage of the cigarettes. Um, I was compiling some of that while uh, working at a job and someone came in and asked me why I was doing it and I said oh it's you know it's art and they said it seems like you're just gluing cigarettes to cigarettes and I said well technically that is what's happening and they're like well that sounds pretty dumb and like a waste of your time um, so I just love that within Chicago I can have that kind of conversation about what I'm doing um, because I don't think that there's the seriousness, um, the sort of hyper attuned seriousness um, that comes with having to professionalize one's practice. Uh, so I've found Chicago to be always very like welcoming and supportive and just sort of um, down, down, down to show up for the party. Um, for me, in comparison to my city, Mexico City, Chicago feels, um, well, first of all, way smaller my city is huge um so it feels in a way like easier to navigate and i love um being in and that's something that i really miss right now but like being in public transportation and going from one way to another and just looking at neighborhoods and um the city has this very well-defined grid as opposed to my city which is more like a chaotic thing that just happened um, so it's kind of easy to get a orientation, like where's, where's the north, where's the south. That's something that had never been clear in my mind before coming here. Um, I don't know, even looking from my window, I get to see Lake Michigan and then it's just peaceful. It's like an open view that I would had never had in Mexico City because it's so dense and we don't have open views like that with nature. So I feel like the experience of being here has definitely influenced my mind and my work. I feel, I guess, more at, at peace in many ways than in a big city like mine. Um, I like the art scene here, and that's part of what uh, drew me to, to Chicago. I really liked the um, uh, graphic novel uh, scene, all the makers that are doing comics here. Um, also like the fun, absurd, aesthetics of um, some of the artists here like the imagists and the, all the, the harry hoop collective um henry darger all these like um, outsider work um, i'm really attracted to so yeah that definitely influences my work and besides that um, i guess like the mexican community in chicago which is something that i hadn't anticipated also made an influence in my in my mind 
Um, so just learning about like the origin of Pilsen, how it's this uh, gentrified neighborhood now, but it used to be Mexican and before that it used to be Polish and the different waves of migration that the city has experienced and how my community was actually part of that. Um, that's just been fascinating to learn and to think about. And I, I don't know that that's, that's like explicitly explored in my work. Um, but I feel like it's bouncing in my head all the time. So it definitely comes out, even if it's not in a direct way. Uh, for me, I think I see Chicago um, as a Westerners of Hong Kong. Because um, before I came to Chicago for my um, graduate degree, um, I um, was living in Hawaii for for about like 10 years. Um, and you could imagine um, how like um, a, a, a person like me that who used to live in a Hong Kong, which is a conjunct city, suddenly moved to an island that in the middle of nowhere, but the ocean, um, it's very different. Um, and um, when I got a chance to move forward to pursue my um, MFA, um, I had a chance to pick between Chicago um, and um, another state. Um, and I apparently um, very um, attracted to Chicago because first that um, I, I, I know that I do want to live back in a city, um, which um, Chicago um, resonated a lot to uh, Hong Kong because it has um, like in, um, in terms of the um, skyline, um, the highways, um, uh, like um, skyscraper, like the, the, it, 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 it just very fascinating that for me that, that, that to choose to come to Chicago um, um, at the end. And I also um, see um, how Chicago may or, um, um, help um, to develop uh, my practice as I am um, continuing building up, um, you know, um, my 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 concept and my um, um, ideas, um, which um, I work a lot of. Um, my work is related to a lot of Hong Kong culture, and um, those cultures kind of um, that could especially let's say the neon culture that could kind of reference the neon culture in Chicago as well. So I was um, excited and would like to explore more about how Chicago um, could um, 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 help me in developing this. Um, and as now that I am um, moving forward, um, I, 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 I now do um, working on some projects that is um, 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 related to um, political or like, like, like say like, um, like I want to make some work that in a respond to um, some um, politics um, in specific um, talking about um, the uh, massive protests that um, started in Hong Kong. Um, and I, I see um, Chicago as a um, city that's um, with that very rich culture in terms of, um, I don't know if I say this correct, but a uh, protest. Um, I wonder how um, um, this can, um, can help or like how Chicago can um, be a vehicle um, for me to um, to help me to explore when I was moving forward to um, some new direction in my um, current practice. Yeah, I feel like there's a, there, there can be a lot of richness there. Chicago has such an amazing history of organizing and, and uh, doing that work that might be interesting and helpful to you too, um, as you think about that. There are a few questions in the chat. Um, one is from Alison Peters-Quinn. Um, she is asking, 
for saying. Uh, in all of your work, I see themes of loss and reinvention. Number one, is that true? Do you think it's in your work? Um, uh, or do you think it's just a moment that we're in? Or is it a theme that you will continue to think through? I can say, I think all of my work um, dating back to even when I was in an undergraduate program, which wasn't an art program, I've been really interested in the act of collection and the way that things are displayed and sort of therefore museums. Um, and I think you can see that kind of display display in my work and thank you for that beautiful glass window that I can use in the Hyde Park Art Center. Um, and so I think like wrapped up in museums, there is the, there is sort of like loss slash reinvention in that you're, when you collect something, whether it's something made by another culture or an animal or even a rock, you're taking it from the place where it was created and bringing it to a new place or sort of like ending one life and giving it a new life. And whether that's positive or negative is up for debate. Um, and I, I think the, I do, I think this is a theme running through my work and I don't think it's, I don't think maybe there's that in this moment, but I don't think that I'm reacting to this moment. I think it's something I've been thinking about for a long time and there is, there is loss and maybe like my personal sadness and loss of, of architecture. Um, but it's more like a, it's more of a, a preservation, like a, an, a need to preserve things that I don't think is going anywhere for me. <laughs> um, yeah, I have always been interested in art as a device of kind of custodial care. Um, and so I sort of am not interested, I find myself less interested in what I make or objects themselves and more so interested in like, how can we think through um, the support systems that are already in place, but then also more deeply engage them in a critical way. Uh, I do think that, um, you know, things don't disappear, they just get buried. So I think that there is a lot that we're seeing in this moment of um, just the real repercussions of, uh, you know, like, uh, like the sort of Freudian thing of um, psychosis being, or like illness and psychosis being a result of like repression. And so I think that like at some point there needs to be a reckoning and a dealing with things that have been suppressed. So I do um, think that art has a way to both fix the eye and kind of re-examine what has happened historically. Um, and then there's this sort of potential for a kind of liberatory tool in which we um, can collectively perhaps decide what we value um, more than what we have valued in the past. So I think that that's like a hope or a potential promise, um, whether or not that comes to fruition, um, you know, that's the, where in, where in hope it resides. Um, for me, I thought about those two terms, loss and reinvention in uh, sort of like an emotional or psychological way. Um, so my work is very colorful and bold and I feel like I'm happy it, or at least at first glance, it looks very happy. Uh, but there are like several layers of meaning in it. And actually a lot of it comes from like very dark places, personal dark places of like depression, feeling isolated, feeling out of place, um, not knowing what to do with myself, like a, a bunch of things that um, actually spark the work. And I feel like the work becomes a, both sort of like a therapy for me to deal with these issues. And I guess in that sense to like reinvent who I am and who I can be. Um, and also it becomes a vehicle for for me to communicate with others and try to make people feel better than the way I felt while I was making my work. So yeah, if I can like spark some 
a joy <laughs> when people look at my work. I feel like that's um, almost like good enough um, because it's hard. It's hard to to be happy, and especially in a time like this, it's like everything seems so uh, crazy and chaotic and just like fragile. So. Yeah, I too, I resonate a lot. Uh, I also, yeah, apparently and, and, and obviously my work is is definitely about the laws and the invention. Um, but um, as as I was thinking through these questions, um, um, actually what is interesting is I think it's um, maybe we, 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 we more we wanted to think more deeply and um, deliberately is um, why cause the loss and reinventions. Um, for example, um, saying for example my um, the work, uh, my work um, behind neon signage, um, that 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 piece is a I could say is a resistance. Um, of a removal um, um, of the neon culture in Hong Kong, which um, um, the Hong Kong government um, started um, a the massive, um, large neon signs um, on the street um, in the sink of um, 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 passenger safety. Um, um, which, um, like, like, like this, this removal or like this action of um, from the government, a lot of um, local organization, like especially cultural organization in Hong Kong, they critique the government was not very valuable. Um, the local culture or the official language culture of Hong Kong. Um, so and what. Um, 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 like those things that were not being valued by the government. So, um, like, like in my response, that um, I um, use um, some of the, um, the 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 neon images and to recreate it um, into another form as a way to um, preserve um, this cult, this dying culture, and um, maybe you could say trying to celebrate how um, great it was. Um, like um, the final product of the artwork is a um, reinvention of that um, dying thing. But um, I also think of um, like, what if, um, but um, if the um, system or like um, the, what make this happen behind um, could also be reinvented as well, which, um, yeah, like it's just um, some question that I think of like when I was thinking through with this, um, 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 Alison's, uh, your questions here, you talk about when you talk about loss and reinvention. So, yeah. Thank you. I think love and care is another through line in, in your work. It's it's all very caring and loving and it's filled with gestures of care. Um, do people have other questions? I also like to ar ask artists if they have questions for each other. So if you have questions for each other, also feel free to ask them. Ask them in the chat. Um, I do have a question for uh, Jay Kent. So uh, looking at your work, it made me feel like I was looking at this uh, post-consumer waste from like any place in the US. Um, it didn't feel like Mexican, for example, because sometimes you can see the brands and then I know these are brands that are in the US. Uh, but I was just curious to know if there's a sense of specificity in terms of location that you're on time that you're interested in. 
um, if that's the US in general or if that's uh, Chicago or a particular, um, I don't know, like social class in Chicago that consumes these particular products? Or... Yeah, um, thank you for asking that. Um, so as I sort of very briefly alluded to um, in my introduction for about a cumulative uh, 10 years, I was uh, living in these communities in uptown on the north side of Chicago um, and working directly with people experiencing um, different forms of precarity. And um, I think it was not, I think, uh, it was really challenging work to work sort of on a daily basis with people very directly impacted by things like um, poverty and systemic injustice. So often what would happen um, as a way to decompress is that I would sort of just take really long walks around the neighborhood. So walking just for three or four hours. Um, and I think something that started happening was um, noticing things that were on the street and noticing things once things started becoming patterns. So um, cigarette butts with lipstick stains or um, one particular type of branded food packaging or things that um, remained uh, deeply pigmented and colorful and sort of neon, um, despite the fact that they were discarded and outdoors. So um, I would say that the objects themselves tend to be things that people consume very quickly. So I'm often collecting things like, uh, can it's usually like candy, condoms, cigarettes, um, anything that basically gives your brain like a really quick boost. Um, which is the sort of, you know, the, the, the promise of consumption and capitalism that in, in a sort of temporary liberatory way. So I think I'm really drawn to um, things that have a quick, quick fix. Um, and I think that there's ways that those things are marketed to specific communities. Um, uh, it's this sort of the, the lie of consumption that promises temporary liberation, but then actually makes you perhaps more uh, economically disenfranchised. So uh, I would say there are definitely things that are like, uh, I'm interested in trash and I'm interested in like trash food, trash products, things that like have a kind of identity placed on them of trash. Um, and then I think I want to create a sort of dignity and respect for both those things and the people who are interested in them, um, who are attracted to them, uh, because I think, yeah, it's it's a kind of, yeah, uh, I would I hope it's a kind of reclamation, um, but it tends to be things uh, I collect whenever I'm traveling. So uh, I haven't traveled extensively, but you know, if I have gone to Berlin or London, uh, I'll collect trash there, and I think it becomes a different kind of archaeology to see what are the what are the um, quick fix products um, within a, you know, like there's a lot more potato chips in London. <laughs> um, so that's, that's some thoughts. Yeah, thanks. Um, it's very interesting that, yeah, trash can become like a portrait of a place. Um, and yeah, uh, thanks. I'm, I'm going to show your work to my students because I'm teaching a painting class and we were talking about steel lives and how to think of steel lives in a contemporary way. So I feel like your work touches on that very well. Yeah, if it's, um, sorry to say two comments, but <laughs> um, I, so I'm really interested in still lives and like, you know, these like gorgeous Flemish uh, still life paintings that are floral arrangements, you know. Um, I remember like learning about the sort of impossibility of these portraits where uh, um, plants weren't cultivated yet at a, in, in, in the way that um, these portraits were sort of composites so that you might paint one flower and then paint something else one year later and so there were these kind of like um, photoshopped paintings that um, promised something that was outside of the scale of people's daily lives or um, sort of projected them into imaginary spaces uh, so I so I think I'm interested in using yeah the the the, the trashiest most humble of things to try and make those composite portraits of like um, uh, yeah, big, big floral bouquets that are like shiny and um, colorful, but impossible in a way.
Great. If there aren't any other questions, I'll end with an invitation for um, everyone here to come and see the show if you haven't already. Um, well, but the Stella, go ahead. Can I say one thing? Just because I have all of your ears right here. Um, I don't know if you're aware, but there's um, there is an alderman that has uh, is trying to change a zoning ordinance that would make it so that apartment galleries and museums um, and really any cultural um, like places that would hold exhibitions in residential areas would be illegal and would carry a huge fine. Um, and so you have, uh, I think until tomorrow to submit a letter to your alderman. I'm gonna put a link to like a crazy wow. <laughs> Google Drive folder that has a lot of information about it. But if people wouldn't mind, yeah, tomorrow at 9 a.m. Thank you, Kayla. I'm putting it in the chat. If people have time to send a letter to their alderman, it's like, that's gonna ruin the city if that happens. And if you want, I have a, a like a really great email that someone sent me. So if you want to have me forward that to you, I'm gonna put my email in the in the uh, chat. So that's all, stop them. <laughs> yes, very important. Um, the Hyde Park Art Center just sent out a mass email too about it, just so you know. Thank you for doing that. Important reminders. Um, okay, so the the link to make a reservation to come and see this sh the show is in the chat too. So please be sure to do that. And thank you all for joining us tonight. And thank you, Percy. Thank you. Stella, Thanks, Jay, everyone. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. Thank, thank you, everybody. Thank you.